there are several times in my walk with the Lord and even as a pastor when I've kind of embarrassed myself. And the way I've done that is I've come across some new truth that's always been there and I never saw it. And then maybe one day it dawns on me or sometimes it might be I hear somebody else say something about it or I read something about it in a book. But all of a sudden, what I had really never seen and noticed or put together becomes real clear. It's kind of like those optical illusion pictures. You know those things? So there's a, you know, there's a bunch of, you know, the, the original one. How many of you remember this one? How many, remember, how many of you remember the old woman one side, then you flip it up and she was this pretty young girl. Remember that one? That was kind of maybe the first one. And then they came out with all these color splash things and inside of it would be a picture. If you'd stare at it, eventually you'd see the other picture. Well, when you first look, you go, I can't see anything in there. But then once you see it, you can't unsee it, can you? I mean, you just immediately see it the next time you look. Well, that's kind of what happens with scripture sometimes. This happened a number of years ago when I realized that nobody in the Bible ever prayed a prayer to become a Christian. And yet this morning, in 200,000 churches across the country, people will be told to pray a prayer to become a Christian. Another one dawned on me when I realized that Jesus wasn't trying to make Christians people who were going to heaven when they died. He was trying to make disciples, people who did God's will now. Now, once I saw these things, they were everywhere. And you go, how in the world did I miss that? Well, this topic is kind of like that. It's one of those, how did I miss that truths? So this morning, I'm going to begin a two or maybe three part series on the kingdom of heaven, which is also in scripture called the kingdom of God. Now, most of us think of the kingdom of heaven as something in our future. Today, you're going to learn that it's something in our present. Most of us think of it as something that's there. Today, you're going to learn that Jesus brought it here. Most of us think of it as a place where believers will one day go. Instead, it's a life that believers are to live right now and right here. Now, this morning, I want to show in your Bible why what I just told you is true. Jesus told a group of his critics in, in Matthew 12, 28, the kingdom of God has come upon you. The terms kingdom of heaven and, king, and kingdom of God are used kind of interchangeably in the New Testament. Matthew talks about the kingdom of heaven all but four times. He uses the phrase the most, by the way. And those four times, he says the kingdom of God. The other New Testament writers always use the kingdom of God. The phrase kingdom of heaven appears in the New Testament 162 times, the kingdom of God 61 times. It's a central topic. So let's talk about the kingdom of heaven in your outline. Number one, heaven is a paradise where God is. Heaven is a paradise where God is. 14 times in the book of Matthew, Jesus uses the phrase found in Matthew 5, 16, your father who is in heaven. In Genesis 1, 3, 1 to 3, we see God moving back and forth between heaven and an earthly paradise that, we, that he created that we know as the Garden of Eden. The word translated paradise in the New Testament is the word garden. That's what it means. It means a garden. In that first garden, God placed the tree of life. In Revelation 2, 7 and 22, 2, we discover that the tree of life is now in the heavenly paradise, no longer in the earthly paradise. When man sinned, the earthly paradise collapsed. It was closed. In Genesis 3, 22 to 24, it tells us that God drove man out of the garden of Eden to live instead in a cursed world, an earthly kingdom, not a heavenly one a cursed world that he had created by his sin. The kingdom of God was replaced on this earth by kingdom of this world. Eden was paradise because God was there. Heaven is paradise, is a paradise where God is. When Paul was called up to heaven, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 4, he says he was called up into, anybody know the word? Paradise. 
In 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it describes heaven, paradise, by saying that it's a place beyond our ability to imagine. It's a place where we will hear things we've never heard and see things that no man has ever seen. Interestingly enough, when Paul went to paradise, heaven, what he talked about when he came back were things he heard, not what he saw. If you remember, one of the thieves on the cross next to Jesus recognized who Jesus was and he gave his life, what little he had left, which wasn't much, to Jesus. And Jesus said to him in Luke 23, 43, today you will be with me, where? In paradise. Heaven is a paradise where God is. Number two, heaven is uninterrupted life with God. Heaven is uninterrupted life with God. In 1 Thessalonians 4, it tells us about the dead in Christ and in those who are living being caught up, literally snatched away to heaven. It's the same word that Paul used of his own experience in 2 Corinthians 12, 4. Paul was minding his own business and then one, the next moment, he was in paradise. He was snatched away. He says of the, in Thessalonians, he says of these caught up people in verse 17, of chapter four, Thessalonians, they shall always be with the Lord. They'll have uninterrupted life with God. So I want you to hold on to that thought. Heaven, the kingdom of heaven is uninterrupted life with God. Number three, heaven is living in God's presence. Heaven is living in God's presence. God isn't in the universe, the universe is in God. Paul makes this point in Acts 17, 27 to 28, when he says this, he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and exist. In him. In the same way, heaven doesn't contain God, God contains heaven. We will live there in his presence because heaven is his presence. Listen to the words of 1 John chapter 1, verses five to seven. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Notice that we have fellowship with God when we walk in the light which means that we do what he says because in this passage it says these people walking in the light practice the truth. I'm speaking on walking in the light Wednesday night. It's just where we've landed in Ephesians. John chapter three, verses 19 to 22, Jesus said this, light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear of his deeds, that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. So I'll put this in your outline. When we do God's will, we live before him. When we disobey, we hide from him. When we do his will, we live before him. We're, we're an open book. We're, we want him to see. We're not hiding. When we disobey him, we hide. Adam and Eve enjoyed the presence of God until they sinned. The text says that after they sinned, God came in the garden. And do you remember what it says about Adam and Eve? They didn't just hide themselves from God. They hid themselves from the presence of God. The presence We live with him and before him when we obey him. Now, we cannot hide from an omnipresent God, but people flee to the darkness, Adam and Eve hid in the bushes, when we do the deeds of darkness. Jesus came to rescue us from this darkness. Look at Colossians 1.13. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So his kingdom is the opposite of living in darkness. Heaven is not just living in God's presence. It's a place for those who want to live in God's presence. One writer said this, and I'm quoting. The issue with heaven is not so much about getting in. It's about becoming the kind of person for whom heaven would be appropriate. If I don't want the unceasing presence of God in my life now, 
how could I possibly want an eternity in the ceaseless presence of God? Heaven would be hell for somebody who doesn't like God, doesn't love God. Make sense? Dallas Willard said it this way. I love this. God will let everyone into heaven who, in his considered opinion, can stand it. They can stand it. Why? Because they want to live in the presence of God. They want to live before him. Heaven is living in the presence of God. Now, number four. Heaven is where God's will is done. It's where God's will is done. Why was Satan kicked out and the demons? Because they didn't do his will. So heaven is where God's will is done. We're told in the model prayer in Matthew 6, your kingdom come, tell me, your will be done, where? On earth as it is in heaven. So what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is where God's will is done. And in heaven it's always done. But Jesus says, I want you to pray that it's not just done in heaven, but it's done down here. It's always done in heaven. God wants his will done on earth. When, and when it is, the kingdom of heaven has come. Heaven is where God's will is done. In modern Christianity, we think that the minimal entrance requirement to heaven is believing certain things about Jesus. So if you just believe certain things, you believe you're son of God, yeah. You believe you died for sin, yeah, I buy that. You know, then you can go to heaven. The requirement in the New Testament, though, is some level of obedience to God. Now, you can't miss this unless you just are, refuse to see it. So Jesus himself, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Stop. He's about to tell us who gets to enter the kingdom of heaven. Who gets to be a part of his kingdom. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. That's who's a part of the kingdom of heaven. It's people who do God's will on earth as it's done in heaven. Jesus gave a parable in Matthew 21, 28 to 31 about a man who had two sons and he asked them both to go do work. If you remember the parable, the first son said he would, but he didn't. The second son said he would not do it, but then he did. Jesus goes on to say that the one who did the will of his father will get into the kingdom of God. Why? Because the kingdom of God is where God's will is done. Heaven is where God's will is done. Number five. The kingdom of heaven and of God is not just a place where we go when we die. It comes to us when we live. And I've got quotation marks uh, around the word live because I'm talking about more than breathing and having a heartbeat. Jesus didn't just come to get us into heaven. He came to get heaven into us. If heaven is where God's presence is, and it is, then heaven comes to us when he lives inside of us, right? So Jesus didn't just come so that one day we could go up there. Jesus came to bring up there down here. Look at what Jesus said in, again in Matthew 12, 28. The kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God is here. It's not just there. It's the kind of life that we will live there. Knowing God, obeying God, loving God and others, serving God and others. Jesus wants us to start living that life here. Jesus didn't just come to make us Christians, which by our definition are those who go to heaven when they die because they say they believe certain things about uh, God or because they prayed a certain prayer. Jesus came to make disciples, people who live with God and who live for God. Jesus didn't just come to save us from the penalty of our sin because of what we had done or from the presence of sin, life in this cursed world. Matthew 1 21 tells us Jesus came to save us from our sins. He came to save us from who we are to make us a different kind of people. So when we obey God, we live in his kingdom. His will is being done on earth as it is in the heaven. Now look at these verses I put in your outline. Matthew 3, 2, John the Baptist. Well, I wonder what he preached. Well, he's, here it is. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here. Matthew 4, 17. What did Jesus preach? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here. Jesus told his disciples when he sent them out in Matthew 10, 7. As you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
It's here. And then look at what Jesus said in Luke 17, 20 and 21. The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. It's in your midst. It's here, not just there. It's now, not just later. The kingdom of heaven and of God is not just a place where we go when, he, when we die. It's a place that come, it's, it's a life that comes to us when we obediently and biblically live. Number six, the kingdom of heaven and God is what Jesus, John, and the disciples all preached. It's what they all preached. In Luke 4, 34, 8, 1, and 9, 1, we see that Jesus preached or proclaimed the kingdom of God. That's what he talked about. When Jesus sends out his disciples, he tells them in Luke 10, 9 to 11, say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. So Jesus preached the kingdom of God, that his kingdom comes when his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. It's what John the Baptist preached. It's what the disciples preached. What do you think the last thing might be that Jesus would say to his disciples before he ascended into heaven? Okay? You got one more conversation. What are you going to talk about? Well, if you've been paying attention, you can already guess. Acts 1-3. He also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days. And what was he doing? Speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So Jesus didn't just come so that people would get forgiven and one day end up in heaven. Jesus came so that heaven would end up in people. People who would do his will on earth as it's done in heaven. And when we do his will on earth as it's done in heaven, God's kingdom is present because the kingdom of God is where his will is done. Notice what Paul preached in Acts 19, 8, 28, 23, and 31. He's preaching the kingdom of God. He's talking about the same thing. The kingdom of heaven was preached in the New Testament. It wasn't people need to be saved. If you, read the, if you read the Gospels, that's not what Jesus came doing. Hey, everybody, you need to get saved. No, he said, you need to learn how to live in my kingdom. This is how God wants you to live. He wants his will done on earth as it's done in heaven. So uh, uh, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. And then he gives a whole list of other things, you know, that we're to do, especially in the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's do God's will so you can live in the kingdom of heaven. That's what we're to do. Disciples are people who don't say they believe in God, don't just say that, they actually follow him. They seek to do his will on earth as it's done in heaven. Number seven, the kingdom of heaven and God now exists among the kingdoms of this world. The kingdom of heaven and God now exists among the kingdoms of this world. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells two parables about the kingdom of God, and he's, it's clear he's referring to the church. A parable is a story with a point. In Matthew 13, 24 to 30, he tells the first story and then interprets it in 36 to 43. So Jesus says that God sows wheat, true believers, in the church, and Satan sows tares, non-believers in the church. Now, tear is something that looks almost exactly like a wheat, but it's not, it's different. They look the same, but they're not the same. They grow side by side in his kingdom. That's the, that's the parable. This wheat that are true believers and the tares that are actually not believers, but look like they are. In the end, it says the angels will separate the two and throw the tares non-believers who look like believers but weren't into hell. You can read the story. It says that the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Also in Matthew 7, 13, 47 to 50, he, tells, he gives another parable, and this time he uses the metaphor of a dragnet. And this dragnet is the church. It catches all kinds of fish, good and bad. In the end, the fisher persons, notice I'm politically correct, throws the bad away and the bad are thrown into hell. Wow. So in the church, there are people who are the real deal and there are people who look like the real deal, but they're not the real deal. 
there was all these fish and they kind of looked like they all belong there, but some of them don't. And in the end, they get sorted out. Churches are made up of people who are genuinely saved and people who are lost who think they're saved. In the end, God separates the true believers from those who are not. Now under that, I've got two things. Number one, churches have deceived attenders. They have deceived attenders. Jesus speaks of these deceived non-believers in Matthew 7, 21, 23. Here he says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, we're in the kingdom of heaven, but as we saw earlier, he who does the will of my father who is in heaven will enter. That's who Jesus says is going to be a part of his kingdom. People do his will. Then he goes on to say, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name, cast out demons. In your name, perform many miracles. That's quite the list, isn't it? How many of those things have you done? And then he says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The, the ability to talk Jesus' talk is not the same as walking Jesus' walk. A lot of people have been around churches. Boy, they can talk, they can talk Jesus really, really good. But they don't walk Jesus. They just talk him. Now here Jesus obviously is not talking about non-attenders. That, the verse on that is in 1 John 2, 19, which says they went out from us because they were never really of us. For if they had been of us, all of them would have remained of us. But if they went out to prove they were never really one of us. Here Jesus is talking about people who are in church. He's not just talking about regular attenders. He's talking about people who have ministries. And he says they're lost. They're tares. They look just like wheat. They're, they're sitting there in the field, the church, his kingdom. Now that ought to scare the jeepers creepers out of a lot of churchgoers. Usually doesn't. He, and, and by the way, how would Jesus, would Jesus know who was real and who wasn't real? I'm gonna vote yes on that. So churches have deceived attenders. Number two, churches have deceitful leaders. They have deceitful leaders. Jude 1.4 tells us that they creep in unnoticed, they turn grace into an excuse for sin, licentiousness, and they deny the need for Christ's lordship. Oh, they'll take a savior all day long. Somebody will forgive my sins, let me, let me live as I want to live and leave me alone. But they don't want a Lord. They don't want somebody to tell them how to live. 2 Peter 2.1 talks about false preachers and teachers who arise in the church teaching heresy and denying that Jesus has to be our master, which is what we have so much today. You want to be a Christian? Just believe Jesus is the Son of God. Believe he died for your sins. Pray this sinner's prayer, which again isn't in the Bible. And if you've done those things, you're going to heaven. In fact, no matter what you do, you can be sure you're going to heaven because you've done those things. Has anybody ever heard that in the church? Come on, I want every hand to come up. If you hadn't heard that, you hadn't been to church. It's taught all over the place. If you read your Bible and pay attention, you realize that's not really true. It's not telling you the truth. And these people, again, deny our master. See, today, we want to lower the bar as low as we can lower it to get as many people to come as we can get to come and keep coming. And, uh, and then we give as many baptism as we can so we can brag to our preacher friends and get high on some, some, some stat sheet somewhere. And so we do all these things. So, so we've, made, we've made following Christ, we've made lordship, we've made discipleship a post-salvation option. Discipleship is not a post-salvation option. Discipleship is the Christian life. Read the gospels. You can't come to any other conclusion. Just read the gospels. In 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15, it warns against deceitful workers who disguise themselves just like Satan does as an angel of light. Now these terrors, these bad fish, they exist in the church side by side with true followers of Jesus. As in the parable of the tares and the dragnet, all three of these passages speak of their condemnation in the end. Your kingdom... It's where what you say goes. Your kingdom is where what you say goes. Whose kingdom are you living in? If what you say goes, you're living in your kingdom. 
It's where things go the way you want them to go. It's where your will gets done. This is what I want to happen. This is what I want to do. I'm going to do it. We establish our own kingdoms. How many of you have really small children who can talk? Okay. Do you know they have a kingdom? Yeah, they declare it all the time. No, mine. They're establishing a kingdom. In Genesis chapter uh, one, where it says that Adam and Eve would rule over all creation, what it says is there, they would have a dominion. They would have a kingdom. Same thing. The kingdom of heaven is where his will gets done. Those who are doing God's will on earth as it is in heaven are bringing God's kingdom to this world. And when we do his will, his kingdom is present. We'll see later that the abundant life that Jesus came to give us is simply living in his kingdom. It's living in his kingdom, doing his will. We do his will on earth as it's done in heaven. What he says for us to do goes. Things in our lives go the way he wants them to go if we're living in his kingdom. So here's the deal, okay? You say, well, what's the deal? Here's the deal. Some of you right now are living in his kingdom. Maybe you never thought about it in those terms, but you are. You're loving God, you're obeying him. If you mess up and sin, you hate it, you don't excuse it. And someone sitting right near to you, maybe next to you, is still living in their own kingdom where their will gets done on earth, not his will as it's done in heaven. They're, they're in church, but they're not in Christ. They're tares, they're not wheat. They look like the real thing, but they're not. Their life is still where their will gets done, not his. We can't always tell the difference between the two. God, on the other hand, always can. Now, if you're one of those people who's still living in your own kingdom, it's better to admit the truth now than discover you were lying to yourself at the judgment of God when it's too late to repent. Say, how do I know what kingdom I'm living in? I'm gonna give you, I'm just gonna make this really simple. You decided this morning whether or not you had come. You're living your own kingdom. You decided whether or not you would give if you came. You're living in your own kingdom. You decide whether or not what you're doing is right or wrong. You're living in your own kingdom. The kingdom of heaven and God now exists among the kingdoms of this world. Here's number eight. The kingdom of heaven of God is worth giving everything to obtain. It's worth giving everything to obtain. Number one, it's worth more than any person. It's worth more than any person. The greatest commandment is love God with everything in you, to love him first, best, and most. The second commandment means to love others, not just yourself. Love them as you love yourself. Now, some people who claim to be Christians disobey God. What? Listen closely. They disobey God to please some lost or carnal person. We'll say this. If you're a husband and you come to church without your wife, I'm impressed. Because you're not living in her kingdom. You're trying to live in his. If you're a wife and you come without your husband, I'm impressed. Because you're not living in his kingdom, your husband's, you're trying to live in God's kingdom. If you're a kid and you came today without your parents, I'm impressed because you're trying to live in God's kingdom, not in the carnal kingdom of your parents who aren't into spiritual things. Am I in the right room? You see how this works? But I want you to know church people massively disobey God to please lost and carnal people in whose kingdoms they actually live. I've gone to meddling now, haven't I? So some of you who claim to, some people who claim to be Christians disobey God to please some lost or carnal person instead. This could be a parent, could be a spouse, could be a date, could be a friend, could be a boss. The wrong person in reality has become their Lord. 
Your Lord decides what you do and don't do. If that's a husband or a wife or a child or a parent or a pastor, it's not Jesus. The wrong person becomes your Lord. That wrong person's will gets done in your life on earth, not God's as it's done in heaven. Now look at this verse I put in your outline. These are the verses that we, we, we don't ever share these with people that we're trying to get over this bar that we've tried to lower to the ground. These are the words of Jesus. I assume they're for real, that he really meant what he said. Luke 14, 26. <clears throat> if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Now, I didn't say husband because he's speaking to men here. But if you don't hate them, you can't be my disciple. Elsewhere in the Bible, we're told to love these people. You gotta understand that no verse in scripture stands by itself. Every verse in scripture is interpreted by every other verse in scripture. So elsewhere, we're told to love, you know, honor our parents, love our, love our spouses, our kids, et cetera, et cetera. So what's he mean here? We're, not, we're to love God so much more. We're to be so much more committed to his kingdom than we are to ours and than we are to theirs that in comparison, it's almost like we hate them. Does that make sense? You know, years ago, uh, you know, Betsy and I, when we married, we kind of both had this deal. Jesus first, you're second. If you don't like it, see you later. We had kids come along. Jesus first, spouse second, children third. You don't like it, tough. It's biblical, it's what we're doing. If you ever ask me to, if she, Betsy ever asked me or my kids ever asked me to choose between them and the Lord, they lose. They lose so fast they get whiplash. Would yours? His kingdom. Here he makes it clear that you can't be his disciple. You can't live in his kingdom unless you love him radically more than you love these other people. It means being willing to displease someone who wants you to do their will when it's not what you believe God's will is for you. It's submitting to his will, God's, not theirs. You know, kids do this. We, we, we go along with people. It's the girl who, who, who gives sex to think, thinking she's gonna get love in return. It's the guy who pretends love in order to get sex. It's the kid who fits in and does things he's been taught not to do. He knows he ought not do them, but he doesn't want to feel like a, like a straight guy or somebody who's a, a wimp and he wants to fit in with everybody. So he makes those kids his kingdom. And they decide what he will do rather than Jesus. He lives in that world. In Matthew 10, 34 to 37, Jesus says, says there that don't think that I just came to bring, bring peace. I came to bring a sword. And then he acknowledges in those verses that following him can put you at odds with your own family members. There Jesus says, if we love them more than him, we're not worthy of him. We know who we love most by those whose will we do. Be that my own will, be that their will, or be that his will. <clears throat> the kingdom is to be far more important and valuable to you than the approval of any of those people. It's worth more than any person. You know, we used to sing the, the old song, I have decided to follow Jesus. Remember that? You know, that puts some age on you. Though none go with me, still I will follow. The updated verse in the new cool church is, if you'll go with me, I will follow. If you're going with Jesus because somebody else is going with you, you're not going with Jesus, you're going with them. Did you get that? If you're going with Jesus, it doesn't matter what they're doing, they're irrelevant. But if you're going because they're going, you're not going with him, you're going with them. It's their kingdom, not his. You just want that person's approval. You want to fit in. It's got to be more valuable than any other person. It's a lot more than, all you got to do is say this prayer. 
isn't it? Now, the second thing under that, it's worth more than every possession. Notice I didn't say any possession. I said every possession. Living in the kingdom of heaven, God is not worth more than just any possession, your favorite thing. It's worth more than all possible possessions combined. Luke 14, 33, there again, Jesus said his own words. None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. So what did Jesus mean? I'm pretty sure he meant what he said. When you start living in his kingdom, they're not yours anymore. They're his. You're his. So everything that's yours is his. If everything that's yours isn't his, then you're not his. You're still yours. So he says, don't let anything keep you from the greatest life and forever you could possibly have. Life in his kingdom. In Matthew 5, Jesus makes this point by exaggeration. He says, if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. And then he goes on to make the point. It's better to go into hell, with, go into heaven with one eye than go into hell with two. I think he was making a point, wasn't he? If your hand offends you, cut it off. Why? Because it's better to go into heaven with one hand than to go into hell with both. Wow, made a point there, didn't he? Don't let anything keep you from this life, from this kingdom. No person, no possession, no anything. We can't love anyone more than him and live for his kingdom. We can't love anything more than him and live in his kingdom. Here we see clearly that Jesus taught what he taught about following him. He didn't ask people for commitment. He asked people to surrender themselves to his will. When I make a commitment, I decide what I will commit to and what I will do. Well, I think I'll go to church today. Well, I think I'll just might sign up for a ministry. Well, I think I'll give a little money. Well, I think I'll... That's your own kingdom. You're the king of it. You make commitments. God, I'll give you this, but stay out of my dating life. I'll give you, I'll do this for you, but stay out of my morality. I'll do this for you, but stay off my computer and my phone. I'll make a commitment, which means I'm still in charge of what you get. When I surrender, he's in charge and he gets all of it. That's a lot different than praying a little prayer, isn't it? When I surrender, I'm all his. Surrender means I'm now living in his kingdom, not my own. As I've, as I've said so many times, if, if what you have, you consider to be yours, it's not his. Look at Mark chapter eight, verse 36. He says, what's it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? So what if you had two options? Behind, behind door A is everything in the world. Behind door B is living in the kingdom of God with the God who made you. What are you gonna pick? That's what Jesus is giving us here. <laughs> he says, if you can get the whole world, it's not worth what's behind door B. Now, if you believe the Bible, you believe that. If you believe Jesus is right, you believe that. If you don't believe that, you don't believe the Bible to be true or Jesus to be right. You just don't. He says you gotta lose your life to save it, doesn't he? Wow. You lose it. If you don't, if you don't open door B, learn to be who God made you to be, live in his kingdom, then you fail to ever become you. You lose here and boy, do you lose eternally. That's why Jesus said this in Matthew 13, 44 to 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid again from joy over it goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. It, and upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Jesus is saying, when you understand the kingdom of heaven, you will give up everything there is to have it. 
And frankly, the only reason you haven't done that or won't do that is the angel of light has kept you in darkness and you want what's behind door A. Don't let anything keep you from his kingdom. The kingdom of God, are you in or out? Are you living in his kingdom, doing his will? Are you still living in your own kingdom or the kingdom of this world, doing your own? Are you sure? In Matthew 7, 21 and two and three, those mentioned in verse 22 who prophesied, preached, who cast out demons, don't know what they did with that, and performed many miracles, were all as sure as sure can be they were wheat, not tares. Good fish, not bad fish. Real believers, not unbelievers who were deceived and thought they were believers. They were wrong. And Jesus said that doesn't just speak of a few people. It doesn't just speak of some. His word was many. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, I was as sure as I was sitting there that I was all right. And he will say, you were wrong. So what's a person have to give up to live in God's kingdom to really be saved? Is all you have to do is say you believe some things about Jesus in the Bible? You believe Jesus, Son of God? I'll buy that. You believe you died for your sins? Sure, I was taught that as a kid. A lot of other people think, that. I'll buy that. Well, just pray this sinner's prayer. In our day, you can say you believe something, give up nothing, and be told you're fine with God. I'm telling you, you read your Bible with your eyes open, you can never come to that conclusion, ever. Not a chance. A person can only believe these things who's never read the Bible or he just doesn't believe Jesus or the Bible. So here's the last thing I'm through. So what do I have to give up if I want to be a follower of Jesus? If you're here today, that ought to be the big question on your mind. And I've got, I've got the answer. It's pretty easy. We just saw it in so many verses of Jesus. Everything. Everything. He doesn't want your commitment. Where you stay Lord of your life, you still live in your kingdom and you still decide what you'll do, when you'll do it, and how you'll do it. He invites you to live in his kingdom where now you do what he says. You live the way he wants you to. You seek his will and you do his will on earth as it is in heaven. You gain everything that you really want when you open door B. If you open door A and you decide you're going through door A, everything, all possessions, you get everything you think you want. But in the end, it won't do it for you. Go to door B, the kingdom of God. Life in the kingdom is worth having. Worth having. You'd be smart if you could to sell everything possible if that's what you had to do to buy it. 